Imagine waiting two weeks to know if you got a like or not, or a thumbs up. In the decades before the internet, people made comics, and we reached out to each other. What was it like? This is the Sequential Artists Workshop, and these are the 90s mini comics, oral history archives. Come join us as we take a longer look at those analog days when communication was a lot slower, maybe more deliberate, maybe more reckless. Who knows? It was just different. Join us as we take a look and really notice how much things have changed. Come join us on the socials. Sometimes it's Comics Workshop, sometimes it's Saw Comics. Either way, come check us out and welcome. Hi, this is Tom Hart. I can't think of anyone from that time period, aside from Julie Doucet, whose raw imagination and raw energy was put so completely on the page as Joe Cipetta. As you'll hear from this interview, Joe was a stalwart at a lot of conventions. He showed up at all of them, and always with his box of mini-comics in tow. His comics were energetic, full of ideas, but also were about his new family, and as such, were pretty unique back then. I'm happy we could include Joe in these archives and you can hear about how much gumption and excitement there was around getting his stories out there. Hope you find this inspiring. Thanks. I'm Joe Cipetta. It is March 20th, 2024, and I am speaking to you from sunny Riverside, California. Okay. And in the pre-internet era, so we're talking, you know, before the late 90s, sort of, before the 2000s, something like that. What kind of comics were you making um, and where were you making them? And how would you describe those comics? So I was in, I was in Chicago. I was in the Chicago suburbs and then Chicago. And it was, this. so this was in the 80s. And of course I grew up reading comics in the, uh, the 70s. And so in the, in those early days of me making comics, they, and looking back on them, they were really raw. They were unfiltered. And it was just about kind of, it was just whatever I felt. It was a lot like expressionism. Uh, and there was some storytelling involved. Uh, there was, I, some of the comics I made in the late eighties were like, one was called uh, Tough Horse. One was called Bash Pimp Comics. One was called Chameleon. And then uh, that's kind of where I got my start. And it was, I think even back then you weren't even like, you know, now people say, well, I'm going to go photocopy this. But back then it was, I'm, I'm going to Xerox this. Because at least in Chicago, Xerox had a big market in photocopy machines. And so we just use the term, well, yeah, I, I drew my comic and now I'm going to go Xerox it and then staple it and then figure out how to get it to people. And that was kind of like how we did it. There wasn't, there wasn't anything to look up or I don't remember any resource books that I read. Uh, it was like talking to other people that were also doing this and we didn't find each other all in one place. It was scattered and we had to find each other. So let's just go there. How did you wind up finding each other? So, well, gratefully, I was, uh, I was, you know, doing art and comics at Northern Illinois University. This was in DeKalb. Uh, and uh, so this was in the 80s. And I was in a painting class, fine art painting, with John Porcelino. And it might have been our freshman year. Uh, there's also some guys who are still artists in there and gals, uh, Barbara Grant, uh, Bruce Batchelder, uh, Mike Rendy, and some others. And they're still in the arts today, and some of them have done comics as well. But John and I really uh, bonded and connected, and uh, he was a kindred spirit. Uh, and so he he had a he had a zine called, I think it was... I always botched the pronunciation, but it was like Kesioki or Kesoiko. And so I did something for that, I think. I got something in there for his zine, and I was doing a zine too. And uh, and so he gave me tips. I showed him what I was doing. And, and it, that was kind of the beginning of, oh, wow, there's other people. There's other kind of people like me out there. And that was so refreshing because it was, we were few and far between. 
in even even in you know I was in the art program there. It was a you know it was a good degree, four year university, Northern Illinois, great state school, out in DeKalb where they invented barbed wire. But there weren't <laughs> a lot of zinesters out there where we there wasn't a lot of other people that yeah hey, here's our community. We had to like go back to Chicago to find our people. So how many would you print and what where would you where would you give them to or get them to or sell them at or what? Yeah, so I mean we're talking this is in the 80s. So I, some of this is is sketchy information but from the best that I could remember I would print maybe it probably started out like at like 5 at a time. <laughs> and you know this was before they had a and I was I, when you staple them like I, I know they later they sold the machine where you could it was a long stapler that would staple them without bending it but I didn't know about that so I a lot of the early zines I folded the I stapled it and then folded the staples myself and and my my thumbs kind of still feel it today uh because you're just you're just pushing the, those staples in on each copy and then later, John's like, yeah, there's these long staplers. I'm like, what? Like, where they, they, you don't have to fold them. And I was like, oh, this, I got to get one. And so, you know, you find out where to get one. And again, there's no internet back then. And so, yeah, it was probably that. And then eventually, once I got a little bit more of a following and people like, hey, this is good. We want to read this. We, we want more. I started maybe doing 50 at a time, then 100 at a time, then, you know, a couple hundred at a time. That's kind of how it, it grew from there. Um, and you were drawing with any kind of special tools. How would you prepare them for the Xerox machine? Yeah, I was in college. At one of the one of my buddies called me Joe, the sloppy artist. So I wasn't I wasn't a good example. Uh, so I would use ink, paint, uh, pens, whiteout, uh, a lot of gluing and re-gluing i uh yeah i probably sold a lot of the originals from back then but there was a lot of uh there was marks on it, it was it was sloppy yeah, in fact i think i even have i have some of the comics here um yeah I, it was one of them and then some i got a little fancy and did some zip tone where it had like uh I hated do, working with that, but it was this plastic stuff that you would cut and then you would paste it into areas to create a pattern. And so you could see, uh, you could see the zipatone here. It's called zipatone. Oh. That, that's what I, we called it. Um, so you got a fold out cover. You know, I was getting a little fancy with this one where it was, where it was, uh, you know, a, a fold out cover with color cover. So that's what I would call a color cover. Just, just it was blue. You know, and, you know, you could see the, it was, you know, obviously I was a little more violent back then, uh, you know, for kind of a crude drawing style, you know, expressing a lot of the, the anger of youth kind of thing. Um, I don't know if you could tell, but here's like, I believe this piece, I believe with this right here, I messed it up. And then this piece here is like tape. And then I just drew on the tape, if I'm remembering this correctly. So it was stuff like that, that, um, you know, it's kind of a wonder that anybody actually took interest in these, but they, <laughs> they did. And I drew some other things. And um, yeah, then cool. there's Chameleon. I'll show you Chameleon real quick. Because these, I mean, these are like super rare. Like if anybody still has them, I'd be shocked. Um, there's a chameleon and I would also do like one off. So original. So this is paint. I don't know if you could tell, but it's, it's acrylic paint on the cover. Not, they weren't all like that. Uh, but, but, but some of them were like that. And, um, and then some of them had rare things like would staple a rubber band in there. And so a lot of it was, it was like straight up zines. Uh, some of them were comics. Um, yeah, it was, uh, some of them was pop art influence. Um, uh, so yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that was, that's what I was up to. And it was a, it was a vibrant art form, you know, it was, this was, you know, we felt like we were on the cutting edge. We were onto something and the people who found each other were like, 
Yes, somebody who gets it. And we realized we were onto something new that had been done at this level before because of the advent of, of cheap printing that it was accessible to anybody. You didn't need a, an invoice. You just go in there and you make your prints. So it, we were onto something. Um, wow. Um, now this is before you're talking about working, you're talking about working alongside jo John, uh, the John Porcelino. And this is before either of you did the zines you're most known for. Um, do you want to talk about that transition when, when you started Silly Daddy or was there anything in between, uh, Bash Pimp and Chameleon and things like that, or what told you to change to, to do this new type of story? So I I started doing a, a a longer form story, which which you know it was still surreal. I was very influenced by surrealism and the, the Dada movement, which was very stream of conscious and uh, you know surprise experimentation. Um, so I put some of that in in a longer form story called Tough Horse, and it was in retrospect it was pretty pretty goofy, but it was about a horse who was basically like a person, but he was a horse and he would, you know, he wanted to have a girlfriend and he had adventures and things like that. I have one of the copies here. Uh, let me find it. And so Tough Horse was, I think I did three issues and he, yeah, he, he I had a lot of fun with Tough Horse. I'll have to find him in a moment, but I see Tough Horse number three. I did Tough Horse number three when I was in Italy. So I'll show you that one. That's easy. The first three were mini size. This is, still, I would still call this a mini comic, even though it's bigger because I was, it was zero. It, it was, I would did it at a printer, but you could see the, the style is very, um, very homegrown. It was mm. like a printer in Rome. I, I, in 1988, I was in Rome in school. Uh, I was able to figure out a way to do, uh, a, a year abroad at, uh, at at school. And so, so you can see, you know, it's kind of the, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, just your, zine, your, your typical zine style. There's a lot of ink, a lot of expression. Uh, and then from drawing, it was drawing, you know, from life, you know, this is the one of the fountains there. And I added some weapons to make it turn like into a story and a, a narrative story. So this was the this was the, the the final one that I did of Tough Horse. And there's there are other zine sized ones. And so after that, I, you know, I'm like, OK, well, what else do I want to do? I wasn't sure. And then that led to, well, I, you know, in the in the 90s, then I. Uh, then I became a dad. And then how do I, how do I, what do I want to say to other parents? I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't really have a moral compass. Um, I was just kind of winging it. Wouldn't advise that for parents. And so I was just kind of writing about my experiences. And then uh, that, that became, that all became Silly Daddy Comics, which was mini comics that, uh, I, yeah, that, that's, I think how we met eventually where, um, you know, put these out. I think I, I probably had like tough horse and chameleon and fact sheet five. Um, and then there was still the way to distrib distribute, um, that was the main catalog I was in. I think by then John might have been thinking about his own distribution, but then I started going into stores and getting them in record shops in Chicago and, uh, and then, so then once Silly Daddy came around, then I would put the mini comics in the, in the, the record shops and the, uh, the cafe, the, the hipster cafes and stuff like that. And, uh, that was just love that scene. Were the, were the cafes and the record stores, did they want to take your, your mini comics and things? And how did that work? It was like, it was most of the places where it was too easy. It was like you go in there, you're like dressed in t-shirt and shorts. You're just, you know, like a, you know, just someone off the street. You don't have business cards. You're, you, you barely even keep track of inventory. You're just like, hey, I have these comics. Can I put them on your shelf? And a lot of these people were like, you know, sure, yeah. And you know, we'd we'd 
maybe we'd write up something or, hey, yeah, everything, or they'd tell you, hey, everything's on consignment. Uh, we'll take note of how many we, we took. And if they sell, we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you, a, you know, a cut and they talk about what their cut was. And that was that. And I think, um, yeah, then Chicago, of course, had some prominent bookstores. I can't remember if, I think Quimby's was around at the time. Um, so, you, of course, you get stuff at Quimby's. It's a major, I don't know if, it, I, I haven't been to Chicago in a long time, but it was a major one. And then there was uh, a bunch of other cafes. I think, uh, boy, I'm forgetting the names. Uh, maybe Urbis Orbis comes to mind. And again, I don't know if these are still there, but uh, it was it was cool. And I think then, then uh, Tower Records was around, so you can get some stuff in there. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was kind of hit or miss. It wasn't like, you know, you weren't making money, much money. You maybe you were covering some of your costs, but then once I started going to conventions, not as a fan, but as, Hey, let me get a table and meet people. Then I'm like, Oh, wow. Now I'm meeting a lot more people. And, you know, you, you get your, you pay your 25, 50 bucks to get an artist alley people parade by you most people ignore you because artist alley it's like the ghetto because people want to see all the you know the famous people but slowly you start to build uh you know a group of people who are like-minded and who want to hear something that's not you know kind of the cookie cutter superhero stuff that was pretty pre prevalent at the time cool i want to follow up on that i'm going to do one thing which is to turn the captions on i forgot to do that That'll save sure. it. And I'm also going to do this thing that is a summary. So you're going to have to click click OK. OK. So wait, <clears throat> there, there's a bunch of questions I want to ask. So would you put like, what would you do when you would put these things in the stores? Would you have your address on the back? And would people write you? Um, yeah, would you hear I would just put wherever I lived. I would just write my address, probably even my phone number. <laughs> uh, there was no email. At least I didn't have email. I, yeah, no, I don't think there was email at the time. So yeah, you just people would have to write me. I was too cheap to get a post office box. I'm like, well, just, I just hope, you know, I just don't attract any strange people. And I just, yeah, I just put wherever I was living at the time and it would change, you know, cause I'm, you know, uh, I, I was renting a lot at the time. So you bounce around and yeah. <laughs> so you could, you know, if you collected my zines, you could figure out where I've lived for all those years. <laughs> and um, uh, you mentioned, Artists Alley. Now that's a term that is for professional and very mainstream conventions. So are you saying you would go to like superhero conventions and stuff and set up as the person doing, you know, Tough Horse and Silly Daddy and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I had those. I might've also already had Silly Daddy by that time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, but I bought whatever stock I had, I would bring it and just try to sell it all. And because there wasn't a lot of, indie zine fest like i like the the idea like there because there wasn't i remember we in chicago we actually had to start one and it was i think it was called upc the underground press conference it happened i think there were two of them and uh, i think one year i even got involved in organizing it uh and it was great it was you know it was all, all your peoples they come together and they have tables and you know, it was, you know, it kind of felt like we brought, you know, the sense of San Francisco vibe to Chicago. I think one year is at UIC, University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. And then the other year we actually had at the, the Chicago Culture Center downtown. And it was, um, yeah, th so we had to create them. There wasn't a consistent schedule. This is before years before small press expo and anything else that, that at least that, that we that i knew about there were again there wasn't a lot of centralized places for information so everything was scattered and if you found somebody that that did a zine even if you didn't like the zine you still love them because you were, just, you were just like starving for camaraderie and so we bonded with with all kinds of people that's awesome um so uh, you mentioned fact sheet five once or twice. Did you, would you always send a copy of whatever you had just done to places like fact sheet five and were there others? Um, and were you a big reader of that? I I would go through it. Uh, it was massive. So did I actually ever go through every page of it? I doubt it, but um, I would definitely use it. 
and um, I'm sure there were other sources. I can't remember what they were, but I also had another friend named Jake Austin, who uh, I lost track of. He he does. Uh, he was doing something called Rocktober, and his famous uh, character, well, famous to me, I don't know, famous to anybody else, but it was Pumpkinhead, Punk, and Head, uh, who was basically a punk rocker with a pumpkin head, hence the name. And so he was pretty well connected, well educated, lived in Hyde Park right by the University of Chicago. And that was another little hip, hip center of town, but on the south side. And so uh, so he kind of had his tips. Then we had, you know, the downtown tips from from John and then myself as I was learning. And uh, and then we also met uh, uh, Jerome Gaynor, who was do doing funk. But yeah, what, yeah, Funkopotamus, it was called. And so now he was in St. Louis. So now we had a little Midwestern connection going. And uh, and so we were all became friends. And there were, I, I'm sure there were others too. Um, but honestly, I remember really admiring once we found out about, uh, I can't, was it, I don't know if it was Seattle. When I heard that, like it was, I think it might've been you and some others would like meet regularly. Uh, I was like, <gasps> That sounds like, you know, that sounds like amazing. Like, like I want that. And I, when I heard that, was that, I don't know, it was in Seattle or Portland or wherever, wherever that was, I was like, I want to do this. We never actually got to that in, in the Midwest, but I remember thinking, if I ever do, I, I will have arrived. <laughs> That's what we thought. That's um, what we thought. Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, briefly, I don't want to make this about about me, but since it came up, we we would meet regularly in Seattle, like really regularly, like five or six of us, and sometimes it would balloon even to like ten or fifteen. But some people really hated it. And one time, John John Porcelino, Zach Sally, and I think Julie Dusay was part of it too. Were traveling and came through Seattle and attended one of our meetings and absolutely hated it. I think they, and you can ask them, maybe I'm wrong, but it felt like they all just thought this was like com complete egghead nonsense and we weren't having any fun. Oh no. <laughs> but wow. I should check in with John and Zach about that. That's funny. Wow. Uh, I remember really admiring that because we, because yeah, John and I, we never, other than college, we never lived close to each other. I think shortly after college, he moved to Denver. We would still stay in touch, John Porcelino. And by then, you know, King Cat was his stable thing and mine was Silly Daddy. But so I never had like, a, you know, I never had my Avengers. You know, I felt like you guys were the Avengers. You were the Fantastic Four, Five, or Six. We never had that. Uh, but uh, but uh, interestingly, you know, that just that little glimpses, little taste that I got of it with myself, John, uh, Jerome and Jake, Jake Austin. It's something that I once I found it, I always wanted to find that in whatever else I'm doing later in life. Like I want that bond, that unity, that uh, that 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 unified purpose and that um, just commitment to what kind of watch each other's back. So I've always, every, even if it's totally unrelated to the arts, I've always wanted to build that, you know, like right now, my wife and I were, we were involved a lot in serving the poor. We we lead a something called mercy worldwide in Los Angeles area. And I mean, I'm always, I'm trying to build that with people, that same level of fun, purpose, unity, and yeah, we had, we had, that was my first taste of it in life. You know, you, you kind of get it in sports growing up if you're a good team or a decent team and you have some surprise wins and stuff like that. So I had a little bit of taste of it, but really the first meaty taste of it was, was in really in zines. Wow. Well, that's a great connection that I hope people will, will respond to. Um, well, I want to keep going and ask specifically about Silly Daddy, which is the thing you're most known for, because now we're, I think we're talking hundreds and hundreds of copies, if not quite a few more. I want to know how many issues of it you made, but also you seem to, tell me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be kind of a relentless promoter of it once you got up and running in a good way. Every Eventually everybody knew Silly Daddy and it seemed like because it was because you wanted people to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so by then it was like, 
okay, I'm I I've I have a daughter and she's a baby and I'm married and we don't know what we're doing. And so I either have to make money at this or possibly do it as a very side business. And maybe I never do another one again because I'm, you know, sucked into, you know, working 40 plus hours a week to make ends meet and things like that. So, so yeah, I was really driven to promote it. And sometimes I think it was too much. It, it kind of became uh, just excessive. Uh, but I was, um, like, like you said, I, I really was determined to get some of these stories out there. I felt like it was important. Some of the things I was writing about, you know, young inexperienced parents and some of the pitfalls of that, some of the, some of the victories and um, yeah, it was, it was a, um, it was a mission. I was, I was on a mission to get this thing out there and it was a, uh, yeah, I, I'm grateful for the experience, but I'd certainly do, I do a lot of things differently. I would just like, you know, if I heard there was a convention Half the time, I didn't care if it was mainstream or not. I just just go. I just like I'm gonna go, and these people are gonna. I'm gonna figure out a way for these people to want this comic, because I was by then I, I was a little more polished. I was, you know, writing stories that I felt mattered. Like, hey, there's never been that I know of a a, a, a dad writing about parenting uh, as a focus and being, you know, young going through divorce and like th these are like deep matters like I I, I kind of knew and you know from the feedback people got hey I was I was going into a field where nobody had gone before with all these things at least in comics and so I I was getting spurred on that hey I'm onto something keep going and so I did so I remember this just talking about being driven to, you know, to promote it and stuff. I remember at, like things like maybe the first SPX, maybe the second one or something, you'd be carrying around this wheelie cart full of all the comp, all the issues, and you'd never let go of it. And like, we'd even see you in the bathroom and you'd be like selling your comics. Like, Hey, do you, do you know, silly daddy? Am I wrong? Would this kind of thing happen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And part of it never let go of it is I'm just, you know, we're from the big city, Chicago. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, 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 there's in California, people are really lax. Like they come to a campus and they put their bag down, then they leave and go somewhere else. And they think their bag's going to stay there. And I, you know, so I'm always holding on to stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for, I think that sales that, uh, uh, perseverance is something that uh, th that I realized that because I didn't have the budget to advertise, so I just had to use my own human resource. And I think there were some conventions I found about too late, so I didn't have a table. So I'm like, oh well, I'll just I'm just. I remember one year I made like a portable. It was kind of like the old movies where you see people walking around. You would see women walking around with like a cigarette tray. And in there was like cigarettes and maybe gum and, and, you know, like the old black and white movies. Well, I've created like a cigarette tray, but for comics. So all my mini comics were in there and there was like a rope. I carried this little tray around. And and even though I didn't have a table, I would sell, I would, I, I was the table. So we would do that when, you know, if the, if the price of a table was too high. Because, you know, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money at this, but I was uh, just determined to get more people to, to see this thing, you know, I, I, I had come up in the fine art world too. And it was so frustrating that very difficult to exhibit. I think I got into one gallery in Chicago, one or two. And so I, you know, it was disturbing to be cut off from the public. And, and so you, you know, there were gatekeepers that controlled the gallery and you couldn't convince them you couldn't exhibit. You know, and I wanted my stuff to be exhibited. I also had some paintings I thought were worth seeing. But with comics, you could actually, you could bring it to people in these conventions or, or stores and distribution was, was opening up. There were, there were less gatekeepers. It wasn't just Marvel and DC, you know, we could, we could get exposure. And, you know, I think in the end, really, that's what I was looking for more people to, 
you know, I think I think any artist wants to be heard, and I, I want to be heard. Cool. Would you so how? Um, just some details. How many issues of Silly Daddy were there, and what years were those roughly? Yeah, so 1992. I started writing stuff about Silly Daddy in 91, but I didn't actually put out the first issue until 92, I believe. And I, probably the first run was maybe, these are just rough estimates. Uh, first run was probably like 100, and then that sold out pretty quickly. Uh, a lot of mail order uh, you know, and the other ways I mentioned. And then uh, my guess is there's probably like 300 to maybe 600 editions that I ever printed of number one. And probably the same thing with two and, and three. That was like a kind of a one story arc. Uh, a little, I didn't know it at the time. Uh, but um, yeah, and then the other issues like number four or five, um, were probably less so by then I was thinking about putting it into a graphic novel. And I and, and I was uh I, I I think I became frustrated with the by then the comics industry, there was there seemed to be a consolidation and distribution. So it was more there was more of a distinction between Artist Alley, the ghetto, and the big name companies. And so in the in the the later days of this, less people were frequenting Artist Alley. And that frustrated me. And you know, the advice, well, you gotta have a trade paperback. You gotta, you know, you gotta get out of mini comics. And and so for just purely for market reasons, I did, you know, I did put out then a, a, a the the first uh long goodbye trade paperback silly daddy collection. Uh, and uh, I think it was like one through seven. In fact, I think the issue seven, I don't think I ever actually printed as a mini comic. It was just all in the, in, in the long goodbye. And um, so, yeah. And then that, that did well at my, I don't know, I, I might've gotten some awards or some nominations and all that. And, um, and, and so um, that was kind of the main crux of my mini comic experience. Although I've gone back to it in various ways, not completely, but I, I still look for that attitude. Like if I'm creating and I don't have a mini comics attitude, whatever I'm doing on the market, I need to have a mini comics attitude because there's a, there was a purity and a realness that um, the genuine, the genuineness is, um, was really important to me. And I think when I see that in other people's work, that they are they are really communicating and they want to connect with the reader. And out regardless of what the market is telling, they just they need to connect with people. That was really important. When I see that in other people's work, I, I'm really grateful. Hmm. Well, so uh Silly Daddy went through six were those photocopied? Say that again. Were that were those photocopied, Silly Daddy one through six? Yeah. Yeah. They were photocopied. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and number seven, did you, did you win a, a Zarek grant at some point to, to publish one professionally? Yeah. So that was later. The Zarek grant was for later issues. So, so after number seven, I don't, uh, I, I did go to a mini comic format for one of them in between, but I think most of them were, they weren't the traditional comics, but I was doing all kinds. I was always, I'm always an experimenter. So like there's one issue, uh, actually a couple issues. Um, I would go to like a newsprint, uh, a, a newsprint, like somebody who would print newspapers. And I'm like, Hey, can we, can I get a good deal? I'm always looking for a deal. So one yeah. of them was like at, at the, I think the same place that printed maybe the onion in Chicago or one of the reader or one of the newspapers, um, and so, so it, this is just on newsprint, and it was about a silly daddy related dream that I had. And, and so, okay, no, I didn't staple this. It's not a mini comic. It's bigger size, but it's certainly it's not glossy, and it's you know it's it's you can tell it's homegrown. In fact, even this one, uh, I I had I had my daughter was actually coloring. She colored the crayon in the back. She colored some of the crayon there. So, this is a rarer one, but most of them were not 
that way. Uh, but I, you know, I, I would, I, I like the, the mini comics tradition of having some handmade components, kind of the artist books. I also did artist books, which is a whole other topic, but uh, some of that crept into Silly Daddy. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. I yeah, partially, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, but I want to continue. There was another Silly Daddy, if I remember right, that was about this size that was also on newsprint, but was quite thick. It had a green cover, I think a circle or spiral or something. Yes. Yeah, that was that was more of a zine. It was like it was a story. Uh, and that was, I think, by the same printer. So it was like newsprint. Uh, and it was a, it, it was my account of being a valet. Oh, right. Parking but cars no. and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, but with news, when you go to a newsprint publisher, they're gonna they're gonna be affordable, but you're gonna have to print like a thousand copies or something like that. Is that what you were doing? Yeah, I was doing I was doing a thousand copies, and I also had some like somehow I got some magazine distributor that was like not not connected with comics distribution, and I learned about that that with magazine distribution you can get in a lot of stores, but if it doesn't sell. And it's after a certain point, it's like I, if I remember correctly, they take the magazines off, rip off the cover, throw the rest away, and then as proof, just keep the cover to show that this is how many didn't sell. So I didn't like that. So I didn't stay with that distributor for a while. But many more distributors kept not carrying my stuff. I kept I I think I stayed with Capital and Diamond for a while, and all the other ones kept getting bought up by diamond and then finally i think diamond distributors who did the comics back then um bought capital or i think that i think they did or they put them under I, I can't remember but but so then i was like okay now cap now diamond is now the only comic book distributor so um if i don't play ball and i wasn't and i didn't i wasn't you know paying for the ads the ad space they they kept giving me a hard time i think eventually i was completely shut out of distribution from from diamond so i had to do all the hustling and going with everywhere if i wanted to get get out there mm. um cool we're hitting most of the topics i wanted to hit there was a there was a collaboration you and john porcelino did right can you tell us about that yeah we did a bunch we did um we did a Silly Daddy King Cat flip book. Actually, we did, we did, we did two. Actually, one was, um, I think it was Silly Daddy number eight. We actually did a bunch of collaborations over the years, where he did one story and I did another story. Um, when you would literally flip it over, and one side was his story, one side was my story. Um, and I remember John's story from was really profound. I think it was called Belmont Harbor. It was black and white. Uh, and then the other one we did was called Silly Cat. And that was from a newsprint, the same newsprint. I think I, I have Silly Cat probably handy. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Silly Cat. Bagged. Archival quality. <laughs> <laughs> I used to buy comics. I still have these supplies. So yeah, Silly Cat. It was only a dollar. There it is. Um, and then here's John's cover, classic Johnny. What's inside? Is it two separate stories? One of you and one of him? Uh, so mine, I think his was, uh, shorter stories. His was short, sto shorter stories. Uh, mm -hmm. there's John's maybe two pagers, three pagers each. And then mine was, I think, a lot of one panel or one pager stories. Um, maybe the, this is a few, a multi-page story. Uh, I think it's called The Red Shirt Roman uh, that eventually got reprinted in, um, in, the, um, in the 2004 graphic novel where we printed almost every, reprinted almost everything. So yeah, so... Um, and this was kind of like the beginning of my transition away from longer form comics be, uh, to more shorter stuff that I'm still doing today. I still, a lot of people don't know it because I've completely left the comic book uh, convention scene. 
I haven't been to one in years, but I still do comics. I just don't release them um, the way that I used to. So a lot of people are like, oh, he's still doing that? Well, yeah, I am. So I, I there's other avenues that I release stuff. Oh, well, I'm, oh and I'm, then I also did one of the episodes that I, I also completely did without John's knowledge, wrote and drew and made the cover of one of the King Cats. It might have known if it was King Cat 40 or, and I mailed it to him and I said, hey, John, if you want, um, feel free to release this as your next King Cat episode. And he did with, I don't think, any change. And so I don't know if anybody else has done that, but I'm one of the few people who actually made a King Cat besides John. It's maybe it's King Cat 40. I don't know if I have it, but it's it's out there somewhere. Yeah, let's see if I have it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, well, that, I'll, I'll show you. I want to ask about why, well, that last thing just sounds because it's zany and you love John and you love King Cat, so you just wanted to do it. But what was the benefit that you guys did the, the collaborations for? Was it like, we'll have joint readership or was it just an art project or... What was the purpose? It was both of those um, to, and it was also, I think, camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I think the main reason is I wanted to do something with my friend. And and then it, there was also like a, you know, a marketing ploy, you know, it was like, hey, well, we could, your readers, you know, can reach, you know, we could reach each other's readers and things like that. And, and we're also, I, I, I always love to experiment, as I said, so um that was a big deal like just you know just breaking boundaries experimenting is something that i like to do you know to your uh to you saying that you love experimenting and breaking boundaries a, a phrase I, I love of yours that i still quote that i actually forgot until dylan horrocks reminded me was that you said um about comics making you said this is not the bomb squad take unnecessary risks Wow, I, just, I forgot that too. Yeah, that's it's true. a great, great, great phrase that I tell people. Oh, that's good. I'm so glad you remember that. that Dylan thing. remembered it. Oh man, Dylan, he's great. Yeah, I, I, and I still, I offer, even though I have, I forgot that quote of mine. I'm glad you reminded me, but I, I, I live by that in because it's, it's, yeah, like you said, it's, you can take risks because you're, you know it's where you're going to go into some new areas. You know, I think what I had to learn though, as a writer of these comics is I had to, I had to grow up and I kind of grew up in comics. In other words, before in my, in my early artists, I would just write about stuff regardless of how people felt about it. And sometimes it hurt people's feelings. And so then I had to learn, well, Hey, you know what? I need to be more responsible, kind, think about how this is going to affect if I'm writing about a specific person. And so I had to really grow up in that area. And, th and that, that, that took some years, uh, but mm -hmm. it, it, it really helped me to just be a better human being. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was not, uh, just when I started out, I was, I was really rough around the edges. I just mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of, I didn't have, a, like I said, you know, I wasn't, I just wasn't a faithful person. Hmm. place you, you called yourself a sloppy artist at one point and i, I i'm going to bring up a, a again this is an anecdote i'm not sure if it's true but it's i think it's related um, my wife was working a long long time ago at million year picnic and she said they uh that when you would when they would get issues of silly daddy in the mail to sell retail it would come in like a cornflakes box that you would have repackaged and like literally cornflakes would shake out from inside the envelope <laughs> Yeah, and that was because I was too frugal or cheap to buy like real packaging supplies. So I would just use my own and you know just kind of kind of rig it all together and uh, and it seemed to work. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe I draw a little bit on it too. Um, yeah, I just anything to like it was, I looked at it as a competitive edge. Like, I, hey, I don't have to buy shipping supplies. I'm buying them for a cereal every every week. So you might as well use them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A couple more wrap up questions that I'll, I'll tell you what they are. One is, what do you miss about that time? The other is, what do you not miss about that time? And then um, if you have any other anecdotes sort of sitting that we haven't gotten to, let us know. 
Boy, what I what I miss about that time uh, is, I think that that we we were together more. We were able to connect more at these conventions, and um, yeah, I just haven't made the time to make that happen as much. And I think everybody kind of, you know, some people. I remember there's I remember there's a turning point where there were some people at a San Diego convention from our crew of people. They're like, hey, we're gonna go to this diamond party or dark horse is having a party. And and I remember that was a turning point because after that I was like, well, I'm not going to that. I don't want to go with those guys. Um I still want to be this indie guy, you know, and even though Dark Horse was independent, but anyways, uh and I remember some of them went to that party and then I saw them go like literally level up in their, the quality of publisher in terms of distribution. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one of them, he was even started writing for movies at, at later. And I, it, it was all from that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, um, maybe I should have gone to that, you know, <laughs> but so I think I, I think what I miss is I, I that there were there's now less opportunities to connect with people to decide on those things, you know, and just and yeah, I, I, I yeah, so I miss some of those relationships. Hmm. And then what was the other question? What do you not miss? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I do not miss the feeling like if this thing doesn't doesn't get good reviews, I stink. Okay. You know, like I don't, I don't, I, I completely remove myself from that. Uh, because basically, you know, the, I think it's been written up before, but after a certain point of doing, uh, right before I got the, the offer to do this book, a few years before that, no, no, not this book. It was, um, the long, it was, no, it was a death in the family. So after I, after, Right at the tail end of doing this book, I got the Zeric Award for it. So I got money to print it and, you know, some accolades and, you know, the nice acclaim that comes from it. My wife and I met real Christians who helped us. I'm shortening the story. We became real Christians. And so basically I started, I changed what I was writing about. And I started including a lot about Jesus in the comics, even mini pop comics. I did a comic. There's one silly daddy mini comic I did where Jesus was on the cover. And then I did another one where it was called Jesus the Radical. It was just, I was just illustrating scriptures. And so after that, I lost almost my entire audience like that. <laughs> they just, they did not want to hear it. They're like, this is the guy, this is their guy who, you know, wrote half-baked barroom romance. I don't want to hear from Jesus from this guy, you know? So they couldn't understand that transition. And uh, um, so I so I don't miss all the all the God bashing, uh, all the the pressure of if this thing comes out, if this book comes out and it doesn't get good reviews in the first couple months, it's 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 a loser, you know. And so so yeah, I don't miss that at all. So now I just put out one panel comics, release them as NFTs, and there's enough people that like them, and they're out there in the market always, and they sell over time. And I'm good with that. <clears throat> Did you say you released them as NFTs? Yeah, I actually, it's a little known fact in the comics world, but I, I am one of the pioneers in crypto art and NFTs. So, so I've been doing that in fact, one of the one of the first, one of the earliest comic that was um, became an NFT is a Silly Daddy comic. Not the earliest, but in 2018, I had a Silly Daddy one panel comic um, that is uh, became you know kind of an anthem for the, for um, what what the cryptocurrency movement is all about. So there's some parallels between crypto art and the early zine scene not as many as i'd like but but that's one of the reasons why i've stayed in it because of there is some level of community and 
things like that. It's not as solid as the early zine scene, but but there's glimpses of it. Wow. Uh, okay. So I'm going to hang <laughs> up in a minute because this is all, this is about the pre-internet days, but stay on and I want to ask you about that. Um, the last question, actually, or two questions. If, again, if there's any anecdotes that we haven't hit that you like just want to tell, you can either like tell me now or maybe like call me later and say, I forgot one. And then we'll do okay. we'll then. Um, we also say, tell us three people we should contact for the archives, but I know you've mentioned a bunch of people. Is there anybody else? Should we, Jake Austin, Jerome Gaynor, you mentioned. Um, yeah, of course, I'm sure you have John. Yeah. Um, you, you probably, uh, you probably have James Katalka. Um, Chris Daros. Mm. I don't know if you have him. He was he before he was a dis big district publisher. He was just doing, I think he was doing something. Uh, we were we were writing through through mail. He did a review um, scene. The Star Wars yeah, report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's what he was doing. But I think there was there was some some incredible women who were also doing stuff. Jenny Zervakis, Strange mm -hmm. Growths. She's she. I love her comic. She was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Daydreamer. Uh, yeah. I think she was part of this the the West Coast crew. Uh, she was doing some amazing things. Of course, Megan Kelso. Um, you probably have her uh, with what was a girl hero. She was mm -hmm. doing. Um, and then of course there's Matt, and, and he was kind of like a separate. There was a separate crowd. There was like a mini. I don't know, some mini Minneapolis or Detroit. I think it was Detroit or Hamtramck's he was from. So there's all these guys too that are kind of not as tied in. So you got Matt Fizel or Fiesel, and he's a huge for mini comics. Um, and then Pam Bliss. Um, she was also uh, one of the one of the big ones that I remember. Uh, Sean Berry, B I E R I, I think. Uh, I don't know if mm -hmm. he's still doing stuff. And then there's then there's a whole, and I'm not as tied in with these folks, uh, uh, but at the time that I was, most of my mini comics, all my mini comics years, I was not a Christian, but there was also Christian mini comics artists who were like super diehard. And so there's a whole crop of them. And I think uh, actually one of the guys, I don't know if he's still around, but George, George Makus would probably know all the people. And then they have a, they have a network here. I've never been to it, but it's called the Alpha and Omega Con. And from there, you could probably tie into all these guys. So there's a whole like kind of whole story. They were like, yeah, they were, you know, that was like, they were, they were really, they had a little community too, but I was never really a part of that. And then later I became a Christian, but at that time I was doing non mini comic stuff. Hmm. Okay. This helps a lot. We'll, we'll reach out to those people. Um, and I'll keep you busy for the rest of your life. Sure. Well, I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping to have some helpers and also to have lots of people upload their own, uh, their own histories without oh, a formal. Nice. Too, so, so let people know that that's an option. Okay, I'm going to say a formal goodbye, but I want I want you to hang on um, long enough to say an informal goodbye. So, Joe Chipetta, thank you. It's been amazing uh, talking to you. There's so many great uh, anecdotes and um, and and pearls of interesting experience and wisdom. So, thanks so much. Oh my goodness, I'm so grateful for Tom for what you're doing and your. Um... Your 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 passion, your zeal to what you're doing with uh, this is important work because it really is it it is ground. We're part of a groundbreaking art historical movement that's not well documented, but is super influential. Like I know that the stuff we did, and I'm gonna boast in the Lord here. I believe God gave us the time and places so that we would then impact all these the second generation people that came after us and then became like big, big time 
where now it's just normal to have a graphic novel section of your library. And but back then that was like, what, what, what is, what do you, these are just, why, where do you put these joke books? You know, my, my, my grandfather would call them joke books, even if they were like very serious, but they, if they had a look, something with a comic, it's a joke book. So I'm just super grateful for this, this important work you're doing because people tell stories. We are, we're all storytellers in one way or another. And I think the people who could put it in words and pictures together sequentially, um, many of those things deserve to be preserved. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to hit the stop button. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is the 80s, 90s pre-internet mini comics oral history archives. This is a project of the Sequential Artist Workshop, or SAW. You can find out more about this project or about the courses we offer, the programs we offer in comics and visual literacy and graphic novels at sawcomics.org. That's S-A-W-C-O-M-I-C-S dot org. You can find out how to support this project through the donate button. You can also support us on Patreon at Saw Comics. You can find more of this on our YouTube channel or through various places where you get your podcasts. You can find archives of this at the University of Florida and at our other partner institutions. And waving at you from the past, this is Tom Hart, the director of the Sequential Artist Workshop. Thanks so much for listening.